Hi, I'm Mark Bittman. This is Edible Education 101. And I'm here with Ricardo Salvador, who is director of the Food and Environment Program at Union of Concerned Scientists. Greetings, my friend. Hi, Mark. <laughs> when we talk about soil health, what are we talking about? Uh, it's a really anthropomorphic concept. Uh, soil is basically the layer of the earth that is most decomposed. Uh, health is this concept that we map onto it, which describes a number of processes that are beneficial to us. But soil is just geological matter on the surface of the earth. What we mean by health is that it does simultaneously some things that require equilibrium. So, for instance, one thing needs to happen, which is that water needs to drain through. At the same time, we want some water to be held so that roots can absorb it. It can't be saturated with water because oxygen needs to be present so roots can respire so that they can take up nutrients. So there's a number of processes in the soil, some geological, some biological, that are of great interest to human beings. And that's what we mean when we say health. That's great. Um, I'm just going to stay on this for a few minutes. So what causes soil to be healthy or healthy? Well, uh, soil is a breakdown product of the regolith, which is the last geological layer on the planet. And that breakdown occurs over time because there's physical as well as biological forces that literally break the rocks into very small particles. And it turns out that the different diameters of the particles give the soil different properties. So you want some of the soil particles to be bound to each other, and that doesn't happen just mineral to mineral. Think of sand, you know, so sand just flows. The individual particles are actually somewhat repelling each other. Uh, so binding agents are organic material, which are breakdown products of plants. And you need organisms that are breaking down those products in there. So it's the confluence of the living organisms, fungi, bacteria, breaking down living matter, binding some particles of soil that eventually end up giving us properties that soil scientists refer to as texture, for instance, or tilth, that are actually descriptions of how well water drains through or how much oxygen is held in the soil and therefore how good it is as a growth medium for plants. So soil is a combination of ground up rocks, whatever texture those are, mm -hmm. um, and whatever organic matter is breaking down. Plus the living material that's in there. Is it, it really does contain billions of living organisms, primarily bacteria, but also fungi in there, which are essential to what we refer to as soil health. If you're farming on soil, what makes soil healthier and what makes soil less healthy? So if we start from those features that we want of the soil, for instance, binding agents or organic matter, that means that we need to literally feed the soil or provide the soil the organic matter. So that means that you don't harvest away everything that is plant material. You actually know, you manage toward returning some of the organic material specifically so that the bacterial populations can thrive. Now, those bacteria are doing a number of really essential things. Uh, essentially, every trick that matters in order to keep life viable on the planet is mediated by bacteria at some point or another. So they're keeping the carbon cycle alive, they're helping to keep the sulfur cycle alive, the nitrogen cycle alive, and so on. So what you want to do is feed those bacteria just like you would any other living organism. And organic matter is one of the key ways of doing that. The nutrients that are the breakdown process of those minerals, you know, the broken, the ground down rocks that you mentioned, that's another thing. There needs to be appropriate temperature, there needs to be appropriate water. So a farmer that is managing toward those sorts of things knows that the soil is living, knows that the soil requires adequate temperature, water, organic matter, and specifically they're trying to optimize the living populations of soil bacteria and soil fungi. And there's a an equilibrium that they're trying to maintain because not all fungi are beneficial, not all bacteria are beneficial. So you need to be able to manage in such a way that the beneficial of both of those actually outweigh those that can cause problems. And there's very specific things that you can do. So usually the fungi that you want to minimize are those that thrive at really low temperatures with very 
uh, low oxygen content, the sorts of situations that you get when water ponds. So therefore, you're going to manage so that there's adequate drainage in the soil so that you don't get those sorts of problems. You've used the word organic a bunch of times. What does that mean in this context? Yeah, it's a very interesting point. Uh, uh, so it, it is a term that comes from chemistry. And probably the simplest way to describe what we mean is that we're talking about material that has carbon as its base. So organic chemistry is basically the chemistry of carbon-containing uh, compounds. So that for our purposes, let's just think of it as that very simple definition. There's, there's no other implication of organic in the chemical sense. So there are different ways. When you grow things in soil and you harvest them, the plants have used some of the nutrients in the soil, and soil needs to be replenished if you're going to continue to grow things in it. Exactly. Talk a little bit about the number of different ways it can be replenished. Well, the, the basic cycle is regeneration. And so this means that some of the extraction that occurs is specifically because plants take up the nutrients from the soil. So to the extent that those same plants then break down within that same soil, so say an annual grass would do this seasonally unless you harvest it or remove it some way, this is one of the ways that you ensure that that cycle uh, continues. Um, you, you can also have cycles upon cycles. So for instance, an example would be when you have livestock that actually are removing the annual grass, but then the manure that the livestock produce is returned to the field where the grass was grown, and so then that cycle upon a cycle does regenerate or replenish some of the nutrients. So th those are some of the basics. Now, in an agricultural sense, the, the really sharp question to ask is, the purpose of agriculture is to extract. It is to harvest and remove, because that's what we're doing when we eat. So we don't stand in the field and eat and then return all the nutrients that we consume to the field. So the principle of agriculture is you've got to figure out how you're going to replenish or regenerate when, in fact, a part of the cycle is a leak from the system. So uh, fortunately, there are organisms, and this goes back to the concept of soil health, uh, bacteria that can actually mine nitrogen out of the atmosphere, just for one example. That one is a huge example, though, because nitrogen is the single most important, most limiting uh, element for plant growth. Mm. So it turns out these bacteria preferentially associate with certain plants, legumes. So in order to replenish nitrogen without depending on purchased external inputs, you would manage by rotating legumes into the mixture of the crops that you're growing in a field. With the idea being that on the net, at the very least, what you're doing is replenishing what you extract with very good management, you can actually build up the quality of the soil, build up the nutrient levels, build up the organic matter, and so on. So if you harvest and then plant something that complements what you just harvested or replenishes what you just harvested, there's a way in which, this is, we know this is called crop rotation, there's a way in which you can replenish the soil by planting things in different sequences. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with just taking chemical fertilizer and sticking it in the soil and skipping all of that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I would start out by calling it wrong. Uh, however, we do end up with it being abused uh, and causing all kinds of problems. So the, the general principle, which is actually not something that we've been practicing very long, at least intentionally, um, actually came about as a way to prevent the wearing down of soils. The idea was it was actually better than what we had been doing before because practices that you and I have discussed right now around regeneration uh, were actually not being practiced in areas of Europe and areas of the United States where instead soil was being degraded and its productivity was being lost. So it was a major boon to essentially find pools of fertility, meaning pools of uh, nitrates, pools of potash, pools of phosphates for nitrogen and potassium and phosphate, respectively, um, and then refine them and then bring them to the farm and add them in chemically, analytically precise quantities. Uh, it means that you were managing less bulk, uh, that you knew exactly how much you were adding. And so at first it appeared that this was going to be a great advantage. 
Well, the major issue with that is that um, you have to bear in mind that you can only continue to practice that kind of agriculture for as long as that pool of external uh, mineral nutrients exists. And that pool is actually quite finite. As a matter of fact, just in the history of modern mechanized agriculture, we've already extinguished a lot of those pools. So for instance, a lot of the <coughs> uh, nitrates that uh, we've extinguished completely uh, were uh, imported to Europe, particularly Northern Europe, from the coast of South America. It was basically guano. Uh, so without going into lots of examples, item number one is that you can take fertility from someplace else, but then you're going to exhaust that. Mm -hmm. And if you're not at some point regenerating it, then essentially you have limited that form of agriculture. So that's one problem. Another problem which is just as serious is that the kind of agriculture that we perform under mechanized systems tends to be like a sieve. As opposed to being regenerative where you return nutrients so that they can be used multiple times, it is linear, meaning that you provide an input on one end of it, uh, some of it is used internally in the system, but then you have escapes in the form of nitrates and other residues of uh, the chemicals that you're adding. These, when they accumulate in levels that are higher than the background level, then create toxicity problems. Or they essentially do in nature what we're doing to the farm field, which is to fertilize nature. So then we'll get excessive growth of algae, for instance, or other organisms, which then compete with um, organisms in their own natural habitat for such things as oxygen or other nutrients, and just create havoc in the ecological chain. So those are two key flaws in the way that the system is practiced. Now, in principle, there could be an equilibrium that could be constructed out of a system that uses uh, chemical agriculture. But that's not the way that we practice that, that system. So there, there are serious problems attendant to it. But you just addressed chemical issues, but there's a physical issue too, right? Because as we all know, when you take a plant out of the soil, it doesn't come cleanly. You're removing some of the physical structure of the soil comes with it. Mm -hmm. And what you spoke about 10 minutes ago, or we know that if soil is a mixture of rock and organic material and living, living critters, mm -hmm. you're taking those out when you harvest. Mm -hmm. If there were a perfect closed system in which you could use chemical fertilizer, you still wouldn't be replacing the physical structure of the soil. You'd still be losing soil. This happens, right? Right. To, to the extent that the soil itself is being lost through the process of erosion, you're right. We're just talking about one component of the material flow through an agricultural system when we talk about the chemical inputs. That's absolutely correct. Now, it should also be noted that the, the chemical contribution of soil to plant nutrition, if you measure it by volume, is vanishingly small. In other words, very small amounts of breakdown of mineral can generate significant amounts of nutrients for plants. Um, the real issue with soil erosion is that that is the rooting volume and really the growth medium for the plant. It's where the water pools so that then plants can take up water um, without having to have rain perpetually. Um, uh, it also is the place where all of these chemical reactions are occurring that we've uh, described. So soil erosion is very important because it affects the viability of the chemical cycles that the plants depend on in order to have what agronomists refer to as extractable nutrients from soil. The living fraction of the soil actually accelerates the breakdown of the organic material. If you just put uh, plants into a physical growth medium and there were no living entities within there, again, that's the example of putting a growing plant into sand. So nothing would happen there. You would get very, very slow growth in there. No water would be retained by the sand. <clears throat> and so, and even the physical, the capacity of the sand to hold the plant upright is very limited. So you can see the difference between just the pure physical contribution of soil and then what happens when you actually add living material, the organic material. When you grow things in monoculture, which is the way most plants are grown in the United States, you do use chemical fertilizer and you don't rotate crops. So you're not 
really returning nutrients to the soil naturally. You're not enhancing the soil structure and you're using chemical fertilizer, which as you said is limited. But even given an unlimited supply of chemical fertilizer, what's wrong with doing this kind of blanketing the land with one crop, replenishing the nutrients that are missing, and then planting that same crop again? What goes, what goes wrong there? Sure. A lot of what we talk about is about what's wrong with this system. Right. Um, the, I, the reason why we talk a lot about it is that uh, that pattern creates lots of different problems. So there isn't, we can't talk credibly about a single thing that's wrong. There's really, really a battery of things that go wrong. But we can't talk about dominant results of monoculture. As the name indicates, the critical problem is the loss of biodiversity. So an engineer talks about a system as being composed of parts that operate in coordination to produce an intended outcome. So systems exist in nature, and to have a system, you need to have parts. A monoculture, by definition, has one part. So all of the parts, I'm, I'm uh, using the extreme as an example. But uh, monoculture, by definition, is going to depend on the chemical fertilizer input uh, to provide what nature or regenerative practices might otherwise produce. That's in an idealized organic system because uh, you can practice organic agriculture, meaning that you're not using chemical fertilizers in monoculture as well. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about an idealized organic system mm -hmm. as a contrast. Um, so when you lose biodiversity, things such as managing the balance of predatory insects against beneficial insects is going to be limited because each one of those insects has a preferred niche. When you have just one habitat for hundreds of acres, then you're limiting biodiversity, not just of the plant species you're cultivating, but of every other living thing in that field. And because the other living things are doing useful things for the other living things in that field, then you limit the resilience and the performance of the entire system. So you're optimizing for one thing, you know, it could be the, the production of uh, almonds and the entire field, you know, for hundreds of acres out to the horizon. But if you need pest control, if you need uh, water retention, if you need to conserve soil, if you need things such as uh, fertility, then you're gonna have to come up with alternate methods, usually mechanical or cultural methods to provide that when the biological system might provide it on its own if it's managed in that way. I lied when I said it was the last question. What's the advantage of growing things monoculturally? What's the, what's the appeal of it? Oh, there's a fascinating story behind this. We're sort of stuck in a system that solved a problem that we had in the 1700s. Um, and this was the problem that resulted when we began to mechanize. And in the early days of mechanization, the draft power was animals. So what you needed was two things. One, you needed uniformity so that the very simple mechanical devices that we use to hoe, to harvest, all of these things um, uh, could handle predictable situations. Uh, then you needed alleyways or regularity in the field where draft animals could move through the field without destroying the crop. That is the precedent for why, to this day, we continue to do things in such a uniform, homogenous way, which has led to a monocrop agriculture. We don't need to be bound by that anymore. Uh, uh, agricultural engineers will tell you that there's no reason why they can't design equipment that will handle biodiverse agricultural systems. And now that, uh, I, as a matter of fact, let me go back and say that agricultural engineers were telling me that, they were assuring me that, back in the days when agricultural implements were purely mechanical. Now that agricultural implements are becoming much smarter because of electronics, uh, I'm sure that that's only compounded. You know, there could be way more sophisticated ways of managing uh, diverse stands of crops. But we're stuck with this method that optimized doing things with regularity, with predictability, owing to technology that was developed, you know, about 300 years ago, and we haven't overcome that. Why are we stuck with it? I think we got into a model where we expect that one machine is specialized for one particular setting and we move uniformly through a field doing that one thing. That is the key thing. Uh, there's, 
there's this consequence in the development of technology that it, it, there's a history of technology simplifying a task, but then trapping us in that task and that solution as being the only one that then defines how we practice in the future. So in agriculture, and particularly agricultural mechanization, we have a real good example of that. One of the uh, best examples of how we got into the trap that was created by mechanization in agriculture is the story of a real innovator uh, dating back to the 18th century in the countryside outside of England. Gentleman farmer, lawyer, by the name of Jethro Tull, developed gout, spent much more time out on his farm estate rather than in the city of London. He despised his farm workers. He was trying to find ways in which he could replace his farm workers whom he thought were lazy and whom he thought were costing him money, cheating him. And so he devised what today we know as the grain drill and also perfected hose that could be drawn by horses and so eliminated the labor of uh, workers that would sow seed and also workers that would harvest the seed and would weed the plants. And so in the course of developing his technology, he did what today we would call replicated field experiments, very sophisticated stuff that he documented and then he published in a book called The New Fangled Horse Hoeing Husbandry. Now that's what it was called? And uh, this is a book that was dominant around the time that England was sending farmers to colonize the United States. So we're talking about the middle to late 1700s. So in that period of time, the latest technology, the equivalent of today's drones and biotech, was this horse hoeing husbandry and the grain drill. So new mechanical implements where you didn't need human labor, you relied on horses. So for horses to be used to draw the implements, Jethro Tull needed to have alleyways through which, in his case it was wheat, the wheat could be planted, cultivated, the weeds controlled, and then harvested. This led to one of the major errors that he made in interpreting his research results. And the error had to do with this. Among Jethro Tull's many assumptions, he thought that the theory that manure actually enriched and regenerated soil could not possibly be right. Mm. And the reason was a matter of principle because he imagined that nutrients were taken into plants by little mouths on the surfaces of roots. So when he worked through the cycle, what the implications were of adding manure to enrich the growth of plants, the theory of plant nutrition was still far in the future. Nobody knew how this really worked. What he imagined was that manure was actually beaten, eaten directly by plants and then human beings would eat the plants that were made up of manure and that was a horrifying thought to him. So he wanted to prove that the manure wasn't actually responsible for the increased fertility that you saw when you applied manure. And his theory was that it was actually the urine that was mixed in with the manure that actually was breaking down the soil more rapidly than ordinarily would and that then it was the soil itself that was absorbed by the plants that accounted for the greater fertility. That was his theory. His, his, today we would call it a hypothesis. So he tested it. So he had plots where he applied manure in the conventional way. He had plots where all that he did was to use the horse hoeing husbandry that he recommended. And lo and behold, the plots where he did nothing but hoe mechanically were the plots that out yielded the plots that had the manure. Ergo, he thought his hypothesis was, was proven correct. Now we know, and any farmer listening to this story knows exactly what happened, so you need to understand a little bit how grasses grow, grasses branch. At the tip of every grass branch there is a head, that's where the seeds are produced. The more branches you have, the more seeds you produce. Well, when you have plants growing in monoculture, they're closely uh, spaced, and so there's no space for them to branch. When you allow these broad alleyways, periodically, then there's lots of space for them to branch, therefore you get more seed heads, therefore you get more seed. So it was a spacing issue that actually ended up giving him, agronomists refer to this as tillering, more tillers on the wheat plants which resulted in greater grain yield. So you can see there, there's a, like about three or four examples there of things that were dogma of the 1700s that we're still living with in the 21st century, just as a result of that. If technology has advanced so far, why isn't there a better way of doing this? Why are we still using a 17th century pattern, 18th century pattern for this? 
Yeah, it's an excellent question. Well, not only that, you know, this is really egregious because uh, there is research that demonstrates that if you just take basic ecological principles um, where plant species that actually complement each other by not competing for exactly the same spaces, you know, the same sources of light, the same sources of water, and so on, you can actually find combinations of plants that will outproduce monocultures of plants. In the best of cases, you can get up to six times the productivity in what is referred to as a polyculture uh, than you would in a monoculture. Now, it's not an automatic thing. You need to find the right combinations of plants. But such combinations have been found. And as a matter of fact, in traditional agriculture, they're exploited because their labor is limiting. So it's been in their interest to actually be very pragmatic and find these combinations of plants. Um, and initially, because the sophistication of the machinery did limit, uh, you know, you couldn't go into a field with a single uh, uh, implement and harvest fruits, seeds, grains, pulses that may mature at different times of the season for one, but then would be different colors, would be different weights, would be at different places in the canopy. That actually was a major challenge in the early era of, um, of cultivating crops in large extensions. These days, ag engineers tell me those are actually good things. Those are actually ways in which you can actually discriminate among the different things that you want to harvest, and so you would actually use that. So the answer is that there really is nothing that prevents us from doing this more sophisticated, agroecologically informed type of, of agriculture. So you don't look to the agricultural factors to explain this. What, what explains this is that there is literally dogma centuries of sunk infrastructure in terms of how we do uh, agriculture, the implements that we develop and sell, uh, for instance, and actually farmer knowledge as well as researcher knowledge. Uh, a lot of what we've discussed here would be news to even the most informed agricultural scientists. Uh, there would be debates about a lot of what I've just described to you because it's just not normally imparted uh, when you study agronomy. You know, we start out just from the assumption that the single most productive thing that you can do is to blanket out the horizon uh, you know, with as many plants per unit of area of one single species and put the fertilizer to it, and that's how you boost productivity. It's a very childlike way of looking at agricultural productivity. And unfortunately, what's not childlike is that there are very serious consequences in terms of the viability of human species from that perspective. Well, without getting into the viability of the unions, human species, what's, what's perpetuating this? Surely. There are other people besides you who think this way. Surely there are farmers trying new or kind of sounds like traditional ways of doing things. Something is reinforcing the notion that monoculture, row crop, agriculture is the way to go. Yeah. Well, Why so, are we having so much trouble breaking away from this? So there has been scientific research into that. It won't surprise you. And the people that have made the greatest headway in explaining that are sociologists, you know, so they study human behavior. Um, it's almost, you know, face palm uh, what the answer is. They've come up with the fact that it's essentially peer pressure, that the fear of appearing to be unorthodox, doing strange things, is a huge limitant among farming populations. Now, they've also learned that uh, the, the uh, vulnerability to uh, peer pressure is easily overcome. And that is that if doing something new, even strange, is clearly and reliably more profitable than the alternative, farmers will go to that. So then the question turns into, uh, why are there not markets for these diverse products that could come out of polycultural stands? So you could have cereal grains, you could have legume pulses, you could have forage, in theory you could have fruits, this happens in the tropics. Uh, you could have materials, you know, fibers and so on being produced in the same area. Well, it appears to be that what we've done is specialized to such a degree that we actually have parts on the planet where they expect that they're only going to be producing, say, corn grain and soy in the Midwest. So all of the infrastructure there has been optimized over a period of decades so that that's what they can handle. You know, there's elevators, there's railways, there's a whole set of systems that know exactly what to do with that. And if you were to show up with, um, say, fiber that you're extracting from hemp plants, totally viable, uh, and even in a polyculture, there is no infrastructure to handle that. 
we might say, is there a market for that? There's a market, it's just not a market that farmers will experience firsthand in the Midwest. And so that appears to be the explanation. Specialization by geographic area on the planet. It's not just that there's a community tradition and an infrastructure, though it's also that there's a huge marketing effort in trying to sustain this kind of agriculture. Am I wrong? You're not. Um, this is perpetuated when you're trying to uh, preserve a market. You use every tool at your disposal, and you know all of us have experienced marketing tools. You know, they start out by appealing to this phenomenon that the sociologists know really well, that we all want to fit in, we don't want to stand out. And uh, so, you know, they all begin their messages when they're talking to farmers, where they appeal to their sense of community and they uh, appeal to the fact that they can be relied upon not to do strange things. Now, they don't use those words, but what they say, you know, farmers are the backbone of the American economy and all farmers know that and then, you know, they use this product or they use that product. You know, so X company stands behind the American farmer doing things this way. So it's those subtle, you know, psychological, sociological methods that are the most effective marketing tools. Um, anyone who spends time in farm country, uh, you know, watching the uh, commercials uh, on TV will see immediately how this works, how it essentially keeps status quo in place. So moving forward, if we, if we accept that resources are limited, if we accept that monoculture is, poses problems that are going to have to be grappled with, what might agriculture look like? Let's put it this way. If we were to rationalize agriculture, what would it look like? If we were to do it so that the systems were closer to being closed, so that agriculture was more regenerative, regenerative so that it was more sustainable, so that it was less extractive, what might that look like? And could we continue to feed everybody the way we're feeding them now? Yeah. If we continue to feed everybody the way that we feed them now, that would be prosecutable, I'm fairly certain. So let's, let's uh, aim a little bit higher than that. Um, so, uh, well, how about thinking about two potential scenarios for rationalizing, by which I take, let's take the best of what we know right now, solid scientific and uh, physical and economic constraints, and then design a system so that it is the best system we can think of. So I can see two scenarios. One is the scenario where you essentially just extrapolate where we are going right now. So it favors very large scale, uh, relatively homogeneous systems, uh, large specialization by geography on the planet, intensive mechanization to the point that humans would be completely replaced by algorithms and computers. Um, and we already are well on the way to that. So there's been uh, such a diminution of the farming population, which has essentially been reduced because of the fact that they've been replaced by large specialized commercial operations that are answering to the description that I just gave you. So that's one scenario. So, so maybe if we go down that route 40 to 50 years in the future, according to the, the Shangri-La that uh, people who are champions for that advocate, there would be such a precise control of the addition of external inputs and the management of the system that due to optimal management, we would minimize the environmental impact, the erosion, the runoff of nutrients from farm fields. We would minimize the waste of those nutrients on the one hand, and then we would optimize the cost because we would only be applying complementary amounts of inputs to those areas that would be most responsive to them and minimize the application where areas aren't going to respond to that. That's, that's the dream scenario. And so overall, that would be a very productive system. You wouldn't see people. The only people involved would actually be in laboratories who would be developing the technologies, so the computerized equipment and the algorithms that basically consult with satellites to predict weather that then know whether you're likely to have a pest problem and prevented by a preemptive application of some chemical and so on. But all done by algorithms, all done by computer scientists, all done by agricultural engineers, nobody out on the field, therefore we don't need rural towns, everybody's an urban citizen, whole system's robotized. 
So that's one scenario. We're, we're well on the way there, sort of. Uh, the reason I qualify that is that the whole business around precision agriculture, there's no indication that that part is coming through. The mechanization, the replacement of people, that part is there. But you know, the whole apply more when you get a crop response, apply less when you don't get a crop response, that's not happening. Now, um, here's another scenario. It's diametrically opposed to that, where you start out by asking the question, not how much can we produce the most efficiently, you start out by saying, how many people can we support such that we provide the best nourishment for the human population while rewarding farmers for managing not only that process, but the natural setting where we produce our food. So we don't pretend that we're going to convert the natural setting into a factory and attempt to dominate it as much as we can. We recognize it is a natural setting, and it's going to take special human cognitive skills and management ability to produce at the scale that we need when the majority of us are not going to produce our own food. That's not a scenario that anybody in their right mind can see. So a very small number of people are going to be producing the majority of food for the large bulk of humanity. So the scenario for how that could be done would be to produce much more per unit area of land. And polycultural systems essentially deliver on that. We have done so little research on that that I am sure that we have a lot of gain that can be made in that arena. And polycultural systems, by you know the very name, address the whole system. It isn't just what you're producing that you're extracting and then using as the agricultural product. It's how you're regenerating those nutrients that can be recoverable. It's how you build up soil. It's how you maintain fertility. It's how you maintain the biodiversity that makes it so you rely less on external inputs to control when things go wrong. So that sort of a scenario is something that's possible if we change paradigms in terms of what agriculture actually is and if we then begin to do the research that develops the knowledge that we need to manage systems that way and then if our agricultural institutions begin to actually prepare both researchers as well as students, the future farmers and the people that are going to populate the agricultural support business with that kind of a worldview. I'm sure that's a thriving scenario. I'm sure lots of people can be employed uh, on the farm in the food processing uh, uh, end of things, as well as in generating the knowledge and the technologies that will be required for that alternate vision of agriculture. Question is whether we'll choose that, that alternate path. What would cause us to choose the alternate path? I, I think at this point there would have to be massive failure of the existing system and there would need to be credible demonstration that the alternative system is superior. So, um, you know, per the sociological research that shows that if farmers can be more profitable adopting practice B over A, they will flow naturally to B, even if they will feel strange at the beginning. Um, so I think that actually establishing the credible demonstration of how the production system is viable along with markets that actually do provide income for farmers that pursue that alternative model, those two things will need to be working together in order to incentivize a shift of, of systems. So we're, we're going to show that alternative systems can work, but in the meantime we're waiting for some kind of disaster? Um, I, I wouldn't put it quite that way. That would be one thing that would prompt the shift. Uh, I don't think that the disaster is absolutely necessary. I, I, you know, what I meant when I said that if farmers see profit in option B over A, that they would flow that way, even if A is still viable. If there's greater profit and greater benefits to them, then they would flow that way. Now, the thing that's missing, uh, you know, one could say, well, that's the scenario that we have right now. Why, why don't we develop those alternative credible systems and why don't we develop the markets and so on? We tend to be focused on one thing that the food system produces for us, as the name indicates, that one thing is the food. Now, if we go back and recast the entire conversation that we've had, there's many other things that we want farmers to provide for us, but we don't want to pay them for that. We want them to be altruist in terms of providing clean air, retaining soil, building up fertility, clean water, all those sorts of things. You know, we may critique farmers, you know, very aggressively and we're not doing a thing economically to incentivize them and reward them if they do anything about that. So it isn't just the food thing. It's actually saying, okay, we want this whole series of different practices and different outcomes of agricultural uh, activity 
and then developing the markets that will actually reward all of that. Including better lives for farmers. At the top, because I, I would argue that's criterion number one. Uh, you know, you don't want the farmers to continue to be the exploited class that they have been historically. You know, the beginning of agriculture is exploiting people that had no choice but to perform the brute labor necessary in order to provide food for the privileged. That, by and large, that continues to be a pattern that you find within agricultural practice. And farmers need to have the same dignity that any other creative entrepreneur expects in order for them to be contributors to society. That's great. Thank you, Ricardo. It's been a pleasure. Mark Pittman, I've been talking with Ricardo Salvador of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you.